So as an undergrad, I got interested in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, I thought it was just really fascinating to work on the very beginnings of civilization before there were any other civilizations anywhere in the world. Uh, and so as a graduate student, I was lucky enough to um, get into a graduate school where my advisor was working on these exact questions. Uh, I worked with a professor by the name of Gil Stein, and he was at Northwestern um, when I started there. He later moved on to the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. But um, he had already, by the time I entered grad school, he had already been working at a site which was an enclave site from this Uruk expansion. And the name of the site is Haji Nebi Tepe. And this is me and the trench supervisor that I was working under and learning from. Uh, his name was Foka Gerritsen. He's a, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, and he still runs a, the Dutch Institute in Turkey on archaeology. Um, so this is 1996. You can see the Euphrates River in the background. The site was, as you'll see, located on a bend in the river, which is a very strategic location uh, for crossing the river. So I worked there for two years, 1996 and 1997. That's when the project wrapped up. Uh, and then uh, you can see the whole host of graduate students from Turkey and the United States and other places. And a lot of these graduate students, including me, worked on some of the material from the site uh, for our dissertations. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. Okay, so Haji Nebi is up here in Turkey. And it's very close to Syria. The site, Karkamesh, is where actually T.E. Lawrence worked with Leonard Woolley. Remember, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, I, I thought that was pretty interesting that I was working at a site that was only a, you know, a stone's throw away from Karkamesh. But Karkamesh is in Syria, and Haji Nebi is in Turkey. So very close to the, the border uh, here. And in fact, you know, this this the the modern political boundaries in the Middle East in many ways are artificial. They were drawn out by um, you know, colonial powers after World War I, uh, and they don't really conform to landforms or ethnic groups, uh, or they're the result of wars that occurred after World War I. So here's Haji Nebi right here, and it's located right on that bend. This is where the Euphrates would slow down, so it would be a good place to cross. Now, this is further north from Habuba Kabir and Jebel Aruda, and it's a little bit earlier than those sites. Uh, it dates to the Middle Uruk period, and it looks like what was uh, going on here at Haji Nebi was an enclave of Mesopotamians. Right? That is, there's a time period before the Uruk expansion where it's purely local culture. Then, during the Uruk time period, in one area of the site, they found lots of Mesopotamian-style artifacts. And since it seems to be uh, constricted into or to one area, or constrained in one area, it looks like that might have been the enclave. Right, we're going to learn about writing as well, this work, the beginnings of writing, as well as th next week as well. Um, and we're going to learn how writing emerged from things like this, these clay tokens that were sealed uh, in balls. But this this is something you only find in Mesopotamia. And in fact, the only one of these clay balls with tokens inside that was ever found in Turkey was at Haji Nebi. Uh, you can see some of those bevel rim bowls face down on the floor in that area, as well as another Uruk style vessel we found tons and tons of bevel rim bowls, not surprising. Um, some of these bevel rim bowls had kind of a green stain on them, and I was told, I don't know if this is completely true or not, but that they, that means that they were probably thrown into an ancient latrine. Uh, and so probably the accumulation of, you know, all sorts of stuff led to that kind of green stain on the, on the bowls. What else we find? We found wall cones. And wall cones, again, indicate some sort of important building was there. We didn't get the buildings with the wall cones on them. 
Unfortunately, that would have been great. But we did find the cones, and that probably indicates that there was an important building there. You might remember these artifacts from the Ubay period in southern Mesopotamia. These are clay sickles. These uh, were used in southern Mesopotamia because they had no stone to harvest wheat and barley. Now, you might ask, why would people use clay sickles if they're living in an area with stone? And that's a really good question. And some people think it's because there were actually Mesopotamians at the site, and this is what they were used to. Uh, it was sort of part of their culture. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the uh, expression and the, the uh, idea of habitus, right? daily practice, uh, sort of becoming ingrained. Um, now, it was a trading site, but you would not expect a lot of trade goods at a trading site because a trading site is really just a waypoint. That is, this is not where the trade goods are consumed. They ultimately have to make their way to their final destination. So for textiles from southern Mesopotamia, it would be in the hands of those elites in Haji Nebi. Textiles don't uh, preserve well, unfortunately. And for things like copper and stone, which the Mesopotamians wanted, those things were destined to go back to southern Mesopotamia. So we don't have a lot of trade goods. This is where my research came in, as you're going to see, because I wanted to study trade. But how do you study trade if you don't have trade goods? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so uh, there was debate about the site of Haji Nebi, as, as we'll see. Some people thought, hmm, yeah, how do you really know that Mesopotamians were there? Maybe it was just like we saw with Halaf culture or Obey culture. Maybe locals were imitating the styles that they came in contact with. Okay, so further north from Haji Nebi are these local non Uruk settlements. Uh, one of them you will see mentioned in the reading is Arslan Tepe. Arslan Tepe means lion mound. Arslan mean, means lion, just like Aslan in uh, the Narnia books. I don't know if, where C.S. Lewis got the name, but it seems to be a Turkish name that he adopted. So they found some stone lions from a later period, hence the man was called Arslan Tepe, but it dates way uh, early to the Uruk period. And this is actually the time period, this, this Uruk period is when they start working with things like copper, right? So this is a piece of stone, this is a copper chisel, and this is before the invention of bronze. And so this is actually known as the Copper Age. Uh, sometimes called the Calcolithic, uh, so a very you know short time period between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, the Calcolithic. They they quickly learned how to harden copper using different processes, and then they developed bronze, but not at this point yet. Okay, so uh, here's Haji Nebi, and all the way up here is Arslan Tepe. Now Arslan Tepe was a you know, not a city, but it was you know, a fairly large village, small town, you might say, purely local in its culture. It, it, that means in terms of its pottery, uh, in terms of its uh, other artifacts, although the reading says that there was an influence from Mesopotamia in terms of how it was organized. That's up for debate because many people believe that the increasing social complexity at Arslan Tepe was a local indigenous um, development. It was not the result of contact with Mesopotamians because it was going on even before the Uruk expansion. So this was a fairly sizable site and it had evidence of, as we talked about before, control. Seals usually um, mean that there was some sort of administrative control, or at least that is kind of the assumption. You can debate that, whether it really means administration, but that's what many uh, archaeologists believe. So possibly that people associated with the leadership are trying to control the contents of items like bags, and so they found things like the, the clay with rope impressions on one side. So here you can see a seal. 
Uh, it's a piece of clay that was stamped with a piece of stone. And on the other side are rope impressions, meaning that it was placed on rope, tying a basket down or a jar or something like that, and then sealed. Meaning that if anyone tampers with it, you know. It's not going to stop anyone from tampering with it. right? That is, it's not like a padlock. You can't open it. You can, but you will immediately know if its contents have been tampered with. Right, so here's how you might, let's say, tie up a jar, uh, you know, tie rope around it, and put a seal on it. And you know, this is kind of technology is still used today, as we'll talk about. Um, but this is a way to prevent people from messing with stuff. And stamp seals are a northern tradition. Uh, they're not, uh, you know. They're not found in southern Mesopotamia. In southern Mesopotamia, they use cylinder seals. Now, at Arsalantepe, what you have are thousands of seal impressions in a building next to this, this town's gate. And it suggests that the leaders were administering the exchange that was going on, maybe from small villages on the outside. They were using their local stamp seals, but they also did use some Mesopotamian style seals, as you see here. So maybe there was some sort of emulation what was going on. Now, the people at Arslantepe were working with metals like copper. In fact, Arslantepe is very close to a copper source that was used throughout ancient times. Uh, and, you know, this was before bronze. And this is, you know, right after uh, the Neolithic. And if anything, the people in Anatolia or modern day Turkey were leading the way in terms of metallurgy, in terms of the development of this technology, not in southern Mesopotamia, where they didn't actually have metals. So uh, in this part, you can say, you know, that even though you didn't have Arslan Tepe was not a huge city like Uruk. In terms of, you know, it still had social complexity, as we saw from seals and large buildings and things like that. And also, it was pretty technologically advanced in terms of metallurgy. Okay, so there was a need to kind of make sense of this sort of information. A lot of these sites were excavated in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and a little bit in the 90s, you know, as we, Haji Nebi in the 90s. Um, and in the late 80s, early 90s, this archaeologist by the name of Guillermo Algaze uh, decided that he wanted to kind of explain what was going on. Uh, and as a result of his ideas, he actually got a MacArthur Genius Grant. You may have heard of the MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, you know, each year the MacArthur Foundation awards genius grants to people who they believe are deserving and need some uh, availability to work on their ideas. And I think it's something like a million dollar prize, something like that. But, uh, you know, pretty impressive. What he came up with was he integrated all the evidence that they had found so far on colonies, on uh, these enclaves, on these local sites. And he's really the first one to uh, make the case that these sites were part of an economic expansion, a trading colonial system. And he wanted to use an idea from another discipline to try and kind of tie these things together. And so he used an idea that's used in political science, also in uh, history, you'll see it used, and, and also I think in sociology you might be exposed to it, but it's an idea by a guy, a, a guy by the name of Wallerstein, and it's called World Systems Theory. Uh, and so he proposed that the Uruk expansion worked like a world system. Now, what is a world system, and what is World Systems Theory? Well, World Systems Theory was... Uh, created by Wallerstein to explain colonialism by Europeans at, in Africa, in the Americas, in uh, the Far East, in South Asia, sort of a model uh, to sort of understand modern colonialism. Uh, and according to Wallerstein, there is 
quote unquote a core, right? And that would sort of be, you know, Europe, and there would be a periphery, right? That is where goods are sort of extracted from. Now, Wallerstein said this is a non-equal relationship. It's a do one of domination of the core over the periphery. Now, you can already see some of the problems here. Um, because when we think of colonialism, European colonialism, you know, we think of, uh, you know, we think of racism. We think of domination of uh, a core that had uh, maybe advanced weapons, uh, you know, had advanced uh, gunships and things like that. And because of that, we're able to dominate other areas. Um, a very, very unequal relationship. And so according to Guillermo Algaze, he thought this is, you know, the Rook expansion is probably a world system too. And the Mesopotamians, which have this enormous city of Uruk, much larger than anything in Turkey or Iran, uh, is probably the core, is dominating these other areas. And they're the periphery. And so people almost immediately kind of objected to this idea. And that's one of the reasons why my advisor uh, decided to work at Haji Nebi. He really wanted to test whether this idea was valid or not. Other people proposed other models. They, you know, um, as if you're going to look at interregional trade or trade between different peoples, it doesn't necessarily have to be this kind of stereotypical uh, European colonialist um, uh, sort of scenario from the late 19th century. It may have been something along the lines of the French uh, fur trading in North America, uh, which was very different from the later English uh, fur trading. The French fur trading uh, and the trading with North American or indigenous peoples um, was more sort of as equals, you know, especially when you compare it to the later English trade. That is, the French... Uh, had sort of a little bit of a appreciation for indigenous culture. Um, and, you know, you might say respect for indigenous culture. This was really a different kind of French outlook on things. Uh, and so when they would meet with indigenous people, they would give gifts because they understood that it was an important part of their culture. They weren't coming in and dominating or conquering Native American villages. Uh, they were there kind of at the the will of these indigenous people uh, and they were setting up, you know, at the beginning, this is early on in the 1600s and, you know, they would set up these colonies like at uh, Fort Michilimackinac on the very top of the lower peninsula and they would kind of trade as equals uh, and bring first back to, you know, Montreal where it would then be shipped back to, uh, to France. You know, you might ask, why were they so crazy for all these furs? You know, the beaver almost went extinct in North America because of the French fur trade or because of the European fur trade. Well, it turns out that beaver fur makes the best felt, best quality felt. And the felt was used to make hats. Everyone wore a hat back then in the 1600s. Everyone wore a hat up until JFK, really, uh, you know, until the 60s. That's when people stopped wearing hats. But uh, fur felt, especially beaver felt, is the best quality felt you can get. And uh, there was a huge demand for it in Europe. Uh, and so they were trading for that. Now, this was different from English colonial trade in the 1700s, because here the English did try to dominate indigenous peoples. This led to Pontiac's Rebellion uh, because, uh, because of the, the sort of heavy-handed way that the English uh, you know, conducted trade with indigenous people. So... A lot of archaeologists thought to themselves, hey, you know, we got to go out and we got to really test these ideas of Algaze and see if they really hold up. Um, and there were also other people who said, well, you know, Algaze, you might have things wrong here. It's a, you know, you have a nice explanation, but there's some problems with it, right? So we'll talk a little bit about Haji Nebi and how that kind of changed things a little bit. Um, 
But there are other critics as well. Uh, one, uh, Johnson, uh, he said that those colonies were settlements. They were not there for trade, but he was he made the case that there was overpopulation or for whatever reason, people from southern Mesopotamia looked for other places to settle and they moved up to Anatolia. And so they were there to live, not necessarily to trade. Other archaeologists said, you know, it looks Mesopotamian, it, it acts Mesopotamian, but is it really Mesopotamian? Maybe it's just Mesopotamian styles that locals are imitating because it has cachet, gives them a certain amount of power within the community. Now, my advisor, uh, Gil Stein, um, as we're going to see from his work at Haji Nebi and some of the work that I did at Haji Nebi, believed that with distance, the de uh, power of southern Mesopotamia decayed. Uh, that is, um, sites that were closer to southern Mesopotamia showed evidence of more control. Sites that were further away showed less control by southern Mesopotamians. Um, also, there was a question about Haji Nebi, whether um, Mesopotamians were actually living at the site or not, or whether it was just locals imitating Mesopotamian-style artifacts. So let's look at some of the things that were found at the site when I was working there uh, under Gil Stein. So uh, it, here's the site. It's a tell, but it's on a bluff overlooking the Euphrates River. Uh, you can see kind of a very sheer drop over here. Um, there was a time period. This is like the uh, late Ubaid, early Uruk period when it was a purely local site, no evidence of southern Mesopotamians at all. And then around the middle Uruk period, in one part of the site, you had those Mesopotamian style artifacts. What was found, what did we find at the site? Well, again, its location was strategic. It's on a bend in the river. And before Mesopotamians were there, uh, locals ha were already developing uh, some social complexity, and they were already developing kind of into a, you know, a, a fairly advanced culture. Uh, there were large stone buildings that were found. Uh, there was a really large platform that probably had an important building on it, um, but unfortunately that building did not preserve, so we didn't know exactly what was there. There was a stone foundation for a wall that probably encircled part of the site. And just like at, at Arslan Tepe, there was uh, evidence of control, maybe administration. This is a seal that was found in, in the trench that I worked in. So I was there when we found it, and it was pretty amazing. It is a piece of stone carved, you can see, with these little designs that creates an impression on the clay. Um, here you can see it looks like a, a person holding a mace with curved shoes, a vulture, uh, some sort of deer, uh, a bird over here, and some sort of other four-legged creature with a tail. This kind of shows you a little bit better what it looks like. Uh, local uh, Kurdish uh, villager who uh, lived right there and who... Uh, what we hired as a as a worker in the trench found it and he was you know one of these people that had a really good eye for uh finding things uh a lot of times when we would find a, a you know a room that had good preservation what we would do is screen the soil so that we wouldn't lose any small artifacts um, and he was always the one that was operating the screen because he really could spot things extremely well, better than any of us. So, you know, some of these seals are really easy to overlook. They're lumps of clay with impressions on them. Many people would just see that as dirt uh, and not necessarily see the impressions. But he spotted the seal immediately in the screen, uh, you know, which meant that as we excavated it, we didn't find it. Um, we put it into the bucket, sent the bucket to him. He screened it and he found it. Um, and it was a really important find. And there were other, these are some of the pictures of the seals, clay seals that were found. And this is another, 
uh, stamp seal, they're called, because they're not cylinder seals. This is of a lion-shaped uh, stamp seal. So there's some sort of control or administration at the site. Uh, there's also some evidence of social complexity because they're child burials that have wealth in them. And as we said before, child burials with wealth tend to indicate that there's inherited status uh, and inherited wealth at the site. Now, even before Mesopotamians arrived, there's evidence of trade with other parts of Anatolia or Turkey. Uh, as I said before, Arslan Tepe is close to a copper source, uh, and copper was found at the site. They, here's a smelting area where they are extracting the ore. You can see the, the ash here. They're extracting the, uh, the copper from the ore uh, and um, pouring it into molds like a, a chisel you can see here. They are trading for stone, which they are getting at the site, and also trading for shell from the Mediterranean. So there are already trade, uh, you know, trade going on at Haji Nebi, and then Mesopotamians arrived, and it looks like the materials in one part of the site, Bevelin bowls, as you can see there, all sorts of Mesopotamian artifacts. Um, but when you look at it, and and uh, Gilstein examined many of the the artifacts, what he saw is that when Mesopotamians arrived, there's no evidence that Mesopotamians were dominating the local people. Uh, the local people kept their own administrative practices using stamp seals. They didn't just adopt Mesopotamian culture. They didn't adopt Mesopotamian styles of artifacts. In terms of agricultural production, they were producing amount, the, you know, pretty much the same amount that they were producing before. Um, so they were not you know, forced to grow more and give it to Mesopotamians. Uh, there's no evidence of any kind of military control. Uh, there's you know, no evidence that would fit Guillermo Algazi's idea of a world system. And so Gil Stein used the site as sort of a way to poke some holes in this idea of a world system and to show, look, Uruk Mesopotamians were not dominating locals. This seems to be, you know, have been a fairly equal uh, and balanced trading relationship. Um, that is, you know, the Mesopotamians were there to trade for certain things they needed. Locals seemed to be happy to have them so they could have access to some of these Mesopotamian uh, trade goods. Now, I wanted to look at trade uh, for my dissertation, but the problem was that textiles don't last, uh, and copper and stone are very rare in these trading sites because they're supposed to end up back in southern Mesopotamia. <laughs> 